Welcome to the Peep Show Podcast. Your glance at sex and social justice. With Jesse and PJ Sage. Welcome back to another episode of the Peep Show Podcast. We have an exciting show for you today. For our main interview, we will be talking to journalist Madeline Holden about her blog, Critique My Dick Pic, her essay on the male gaze, and the state of feminism. But before we do that, anthropologist and organizer Kate Doyle Griffiths joins us for our news segment where we discuss whether the upcoming international women's strike makes sense for sex workers. Joining us for our new segment today, we have Kate Doyle Griffith, who is a doctoral candidate at the SUNY Graduate Center in the Department of Anthropology. She is a member of In Red Bloom and an organizer with the International Women's Strike. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I want to hear about the work that you've been doing with the International Women's Strike. Can you tell us a little bit about that? This is the third year that we're organizing the International Women's Strike. The first year, of course, was just like I think everybody else, we were very excited and thrilled to see a kind of bubbling up of feminist grassroots anger. Mm -hmm. I think if you were paying attention, you really saw this start happening on some of these sort of massive liberal Facebook groups, feminist Facebook groups, leading up to and immediately following the election of Trump. So people started talking on that level about having a big march. And we saw that come to fruition right in the Women's March that year, which was the biggest single march, I think, that has ever happened in the United States. There was a particularly interesting development that happened around that time, which was the Women's March itself kind of started off the much more Hillary Clinton feminism. The original organizing committee, I believe, was all white women and mostly middle class or upper, upper middle class political organizers. Right. And grassroots rank and file feminists, however you'd want to put it, really push back on that, right? And push for some representation of women of color, push for representation of trans women Mm -hmm. on the organizing committee and on the speakers list, push for particularly diversity of views around Palestine and some representation for uh, people supportive of the liberation of Palestine, right, as a, as a feminist issue, which was incredible to see to me. And also push back on an initial line that was being put forward that was anti-sex work. So the last kind of big fight was a was a fight over recognizing sex work as work and recognizing sex workers as organizers, right, in the feminist struggle. Right. So for us, those that. became kind of four points that we wanted to bring forward after this Women's March as a next step and as a move toward a more working class focused feminism. And so we called for a women's strike to be the next step after the initial women's march. How is the women's strike conceptualized and what are the main hopes that would come out of the women's strike? The first year we called for an all-day strike. The second year we called for for an hour-long strike. But to really demonstrate that women work both in paid sector work, you know, often in sort of feminized jobs, but sometimes not, right? right. As well as the kind of unpaid work that many women do, housework, emotional labor, all those things. So that there was a pretty broad call to strike And in some ways, that was sort of what it means to you. So let's go back to this idea of like recognizing sex workers within the movement. Part of the thing that I was thinking about in relationship to sex work communities, which we're a part of, is that most of us are working in the gig economy. And a lot of that is underground gig economies. What does a strike look like for sex workers? It looks pretty much the same as it does for other workers in the gig economy, right? People who are freelance writers also ask us the same kinds of questions. And I think Mm -hmm. sex workers actually have a particular advantage compared to some other gig economy workers in that they often have personal relationships with their clients, friendly relationships with their clients. Right. One thing people can do is communicate with their clients what this is about and ask for support from people who are patronizing sex workers. That's a thing to mobilize. So obviously some people aren't going to be able to strike for a whole day, but some people might be able to use it as an educational tool to say, hey, even if I'm working today, maybe you also want to come down with me later this afternoon to the rally for the women's strike and show your support for sex worker rights. Yeah. I actually think that what you said is really interesting in the sense that there's a lot of ways in which sex workers can be really effective or powerful in the sense that the relationships that we have are fairly strong ties in ways that traditional employment isn't. The other thing I think is organizing for a women's strike where you are might be a way of meeting other sex workers who are interested in organizing as workers and adding on to or moving beyond a kind of lobbying approach to sex worker rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to something that's more community based. Yeah. And, and, you know, I know that some people set up 
co-ops, but also just networks for self-protection and so forth. And so organizing can kind of manifest itself in all different kinds of ways. I don't have a prescription for it, but it's certainly something that I've seen happen in all kinds of different industries, including sex work. On an ideal world, it might lead to more support for sex workers from non-sex workers, right? From women who understand or perhaps come to understand sex workers' rights as part of a broader feminist agenda and are interested and willing to build bridges to the broader community. Because I feel like in a lot of ways, we're often organizing in isolation. And frankly, a lot of other people just either tend not to understand the kind of issues that sex workers are dealing with, or alternatively, are actively and aggressively pushing agendas that are very much antithetical to the actual needs of sex workers. I think that's 100% right. And that's certainly a goal of the women's strike explicitly. I also think it's important to sort of think about how to motivate those solidarities beyond a kind of moralism, right? Because then you can kind of get in this back and forth battle with anti-sex work feminists, right? It's not just people that are in, are against sex workers and sex work, but whole groups of feminists are, right? Right. And rather than kind of be engaged in a morally framed debate around that, which I find stultifying and typically goes nowhere, I like to really <laughs> think about what are the material basis for solidarity between women and obviously not just women, also non-binary people, all kinds of queer people right? and men. I mean, men are also part of the organizing for the women's strike, even though it's called the women's strike. I can think of one very concrete example, which is, you know, FOSTA-SESTA, this horrible set of bills that has crashed down on sex workers, is something that I think all people interested in labor organizing, all people interested in social movement organizing, and all people interested in feminism have to take quite seriously as a threat to free speech, and particularly as a threat to free speech as it relates to organizing. Because as you all know, the legislation makes online platforms responsible for illegal acts that are discussed you now that they publish, right? Either right. Whether mm-hmm. that's in private chats or it's in hosting a server or whatever, it's, it's very expansive. And increasingly, all kinds of things I consider freedom of speech and freedom of association are illegal or semi-legal. The old labor movement maxim is that an illegal strike stops being illegal when it wins. Yeah. But Facebook is a single entity that can be enjoined. And that, I think, can have a very potentially chilling effect on organizing of all kinds if we let stand the idea that these internet publishers, right, are responsible for any speech that is motivated on their platforms. Right, because that incentivizes all of those platforms to shut down any conversations that seem threatening to them. Yeah, right, or seem vaguely illegal right. in any way. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, FOSTA SESTA is still limited to speech that promotes or facilitates prostitution. Trafficking. Well, so think about also or- organizing around immigrant rights. I mean, people who are organizing to go to the border to support, you know, migrants at the border. Yeah. I mean, to be clear, it is actually prostitution and not trafficking. So it was sold as trafficking, but the actual language of the bill is prostitution. But in any case, it has had a chilling effect already on very specific things like harm reduction efforts Mm -hmm. within the sex worker community and sex worker organizing. Certainly, the concern is very real if we have more creep, more bills that are Mm -hmm. situating liability on these internet platforms, presumably we'll see other forms of organizing being shut down as well. And, you know, Mm -hmm. that could extend to legal strikes. I don't mean to at all minimize the direct impact on sex workers, which I'm quite aware has been extreme. But I do want to point to some of the broader impacts just because I think that gets discussed less. Facebook isn't required to adhere to some definition of what it thinks prostitution looks like. Right. right? Absolutely. Um, It just has to decide that it looks fishy to Facebook or it looks fishy to Craigslist or it looks fishy to whatever the platform is. You know, as a queer person, one of my fears is that often just queer people doing anything looks like prostitution. I mean, we know that's the case on the street. Mm -hmm. Queer folks get harassed all the time just for walking down the street. There's documented cases of queer folks getting arrested for possessing condoms while walking down the street because that's considered to be a indication that they're intending to engage in prostitution. Yeah. So why don't you tell us about the events that are coming up? Yeah, I mean, so I'm in New York, and I can tell you a little bit about that. The main call that is going out for this year is a call for for anti-capitalist, well, in New York, it's for anti-capitalist blocks to join women's marches and be visibly kind of anti-capitalist. And uh, broadly, the call is for kind of feminism for the 99% or, or working class feminist contingents to join 
the larger women's march and be visible put mm-hmm. out for example our platform that explains what we mean by working class feminism and feminism for the 99 percent or anti-capitalist feminism where would you direct people who want to know what's going on in their communities we, we have a website it's called womenstrikeus.org okay and there's also a, a pretty active facebook page where we post various kinds of material, but including material about organizing is happening in various locations. And of course, you can just message us on there or email us at the womenstrikeus.org email, which is the same thing at Gmail. And, you know, we can try to hook you up with people that are organizing or support anybody who's interested in, in building a contingent where they are. The other thing about these contingents is over the fall, right, when Trump announced his intent to Clear the non-existence of trans people. Right. <laughs> yes. And during the Kavanaugh hearings and appointments, we helped organize with a number of other mostly socialist organizations, a series of demonstrations here in New York, and, and other people did similar kinds of united front activities in different cities. Yeah, um, we certainly were, did that in Pittsburgh as well. I remember seeing that. You know, here in New York, we marched around and had a, a bunch of different marches in Grand Central, a series of sort of escalating marches around these different issues and trying to draw connections between them. And it's that same kind of network that is helping to build these contingents. So it's not just the International Women's Strike as it has been organized over the last two years, but also includes various kinds of organizations like DSA chapters in different places, but also socialist action, socialist alternatives, international socialist organizations. So in, in some places, our contingent might look more like it's organized by one of those specific groups, just kind of depending on where people have the numbers and the capacity to build a contingent. But the idea is that we're kind of all in this together around this conception of a of a working class feminism. What would you say to working class women, people who are in the gig economy, you know, who might hear the word strike, think to themselves, I can't afford to miss out on a paycheck. I can't mm-hmm risk not doing my contract labor today because they'll simply hire somebody else. Mm -hmm. People with that level of contingency or economic need, what would you say to those folks who might bristle at the notion of a strike and think to themselves, this is going to hurt me and my family? Yeah, I mean, I definitely understand the question and, and I definitely understand the fear. I think that's attached to really any kind of strike organizing. Historically, it's not the case, right? That it's the most privileged women who've gone on strike. It's quite the opposite. But second, what I would say is that it's organizing that makes it possible to go on strike. So I'm certainly not trying to discount people's immediate needs or suggest that a strike is somehow like an individual moral action that, you know, you should take any risk at all in order to participate individually in a strike. That's not how strikes work. One of the things that we've done in the past locally, and that I highly suggest any local organizers do, is to set up a strike fund for people who face consequences for going on strike. That did happen to me at one point. The other thing is to take the kind of action that's possible with as many people as possible on that day of the strike and use it as a way to build toward uh, more capacity, more ability to take action. So, you know, the idea that this gig economy, right, is somehow a totally new mode under capitalism is just wrong. The way that people have organized in response to that in the past, right, is to set up organized worker-controlled hiring halls that can distribute work in a fair way, right? In a way that doesn't involve constant churn of competition between hmm. um, workers, the same skills or, or selling the same products. And also those, you know, those have often become mechanisms for building up people's skill, building up solidarity and building up the kind of capacity to really go on strike as a group. There's a propagandistic element to this kind of a call for women's strike. And it's hopefully one that can help support concrete organizing going forward and build collective capacity to go on strike. Yeah. One of the ways that I know that sex workers are most organized right now, right, is around networks for mutual safety and information about bad clients, about other kinds of dangers of the industry. Right. And those, I think, are the kinds of networks that I would want to see take on more tasks, right, as as organizing spaces for sex workers and make it more possible for people to mm-hmm. be as public as they need or want to be, make it more possible for people to defend their their safety as workers, but also to defend their just getting paid for the work that you do, you know, and to defend against this kind of playing workers off each other that can happen in any kind of labor marketplace. Yeah, I think that's all really helpful. Did you have anything else you wanted to ask before we sign off, PJ? No, no, I was just processing all of that. Yeah. I, I think that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting the point you're making about these existing networks and the kind of solidarity that comes out of sharing safety information and that sort of thing and the way that those can be a starting point for thinking about community and solidarity as opposed to competition in 
the marketplace? Because I definitely feel like there's elements of both. Yeah. People are torn between the two, feeling like their fellow workers are competitors and, you know, feeling like they're also the basis of a community and the people who can best understand their struggles and that sort of thing. The other thing about sex work as an industry is that it overlaps heavily with other kinds of communities and networks. I personally am just thinking of queer communities. Yeah, absolutely. And that can also give us another sort of overlapping, because obviously not all sex workers can be out about the kind of work that they do. Right. Um, and so I often think of queer community as a way to organize for and with and as sex workers, but with also giving people some cover from the dangers from being an individual who's publicly out as a sex worker when that's not feasible or possible. Although, obviously, you know, the more that people are able to do that, I think the better off all sex workers are going to be. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. That was really interesting and really informative. So we appreciate you bringing all of your organizing efforts and information to our listeners. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Is there places that people could find out more about your work and what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook I and I'm pretty ecumenical about friends on Facebook. And my name is just my name, Kate Doyle Griffiths on Facebook. And I've recently become a Twitter person, which is a little <laughs> odd, but uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm at Kate Griff. At Twitter, I have an academia.edu profile where you can read stuff I've written, which is mostly about strikes, as it turns out. I didn't start out thinking I was just going to be a strike anthropologist, but it's kind of started to pan out that way. So um, <laughs> It's funny how you end you up could... with a specialty. Yeah. Oh, and, and I guess I also have a Patreon, which also links most of the things that I've written and has other snippets and so forth. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much. Today we have Madeline Holden with us. She is a lawyer and writer based between Berlin and New Zealand, covering gender, sex, relationships, and power as her main beats. Thanks so much for joining us today, Maddie. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm really interested in the writing that you've been doing for Mel. Can you tell us how you started writing about sex and relationships? I guess I started when I started Critique My Dick Pick, which is a blog that I ran. That was on Tumblr, right? Yeah, it was on Tumblr, and Tumblr has just recently decided they're going to ban all adult content, which yeah. basically put Critique My Dick Pic completely out of action. How did you start that? I started Critique My Dick Pic because of the general sort of consensus that dick pics are not only annoying, like usually sent to women unsolicited and just a kind of annoyance, but also because they're just usually so bad in quality. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. there's nothing about them that's actually erotic or kind of artistic. And I received a good dick pic once. This is back in 2013, which is when I started. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a historical which, which moment. Which you remember because clearly <laughs> it's so out of the ordinary. But. Yeah, exactly. So it was somebody that I was seeing, so it wasn't, you know, just out of the blue and it was well composed. And I was talking to some friends about how unusual an experience that was. And we sort of joked about the idea of setting up some kind of public service to tell men how to take better dick pics, basically. <laughs> and then I just took the joke to its logical conclusion and actually... <laughs> <laughs> It takes a special kind of person to turn a late night joke into a real living, breathing blog. Yes, it does. Yes. <laughs> Were people super interested in sending their dick pics to your Tumblr blog? Oh, the response was incredible. And a question people used to ask me often when I first started the project was, do you have enough dick pics to critique? <laughs> <laughs> I laugh because I was immediately just inundated with submissions. I set up a special critique my dick pic at gmail.com email account and invited men and anybody else who had a penis, whether it was a flesh and blood penis or a silicon one, to send me the pictures. They did in the hundreds. And Basically, the conceit of the blog was always that I wasn't going to critique the body or the dick itself. It was always about the picture, the quality of the picture. So I talked about things like lighting and pose and tone. Do you have a background in art or photography? 
No, I don't have any formal background in those subjects. I mean, I'm a lawyer, which is a really kind of congruent <laughs> profession. <laughs> But I did, I did a BA as well. So I had the odd kind of art history paper in there. But otherwise, no, my only sort of expertise is that I have been sent so many dick pics in my life. <laughs> um, that absolutely. seems like a totally legitimate qualification. I'm curious if men ever pushed back on that and asked if you would critique their actual dicks. Yes, quite often. Some that would just invite me to critique the dick that say, I know that you don't normally do this, but feel free, you know, feel most welcome to talk about the dick itself, which obviously I never wanted to do. And yeah. some who pushed a little bit harder and, you know, said, I'll pay you, but I want it to be a critique of the dick, not just the picture. And yeah, again, I would just turn those ones down. I was going to say, I mean, that's a whole job in sex work is to critique people's dicks. So you should certainly get paid for that if <laughs> you're doing yeah. people's actual. Yeah, exactly. And there are plenty of places people can go, like you say, to get that yeah. service. It just was never what I was about. Right. Yeah. Even for your blog, I thought I read you eventually did start taking payment for the dick ratings. Yes, I did. But it was still just the same premise. So I didn't take yeah. payment to critique the dick it was always still the picture but in an attempt to kind of monetize the blog because it had become so popular but I wasn't making any money out of it I started doing guaranteed reviews on the site so basically I've always received so many more submissions than I can review on the site so I developed a little scheme where you could guarantee that you would be one of the people who appeared on the site and also private reviews. So if you didn't want a picture of your dick to be on the internet, but you did want to know if your dick pic was good or not. What was the response to charging for those guaranteed reviews? It was quite good. I mean, I'm not a millionaire from it, but I started to make a steady little income from the blog after that point. So people tended to be more interested in paying for guaranteed reviews. There ended up being this perverse kind of strong desire for people to be on the site. You know, they really just wanted to see themselves on Critique My Dick Pic. Ah, yeah. I see. Yeah. Because it, it ended up having quite a big following. Yeah, there was almost an exhibitionist streak. Did a lot of people show their faces in those pictures as well? No, not often. Maybe only about 1%, I would estimate, would include their faces. But some people would and some people would say... I'm quite happy for this to go up on the site. I don't mind if people see my face. And I mean, Mm -hmm. some people have their own tumblers and they're naked on them and their faces are on there and they just don't mind. Right. I think it's really interesting, the project. I mean, first, the scheme that you came up with in terms of monetizing it is interesting in that it kind of communicates to men, hey, this is labor or this is something of value if you send this to someone you're not entitled to a response yeah I still wonder how many men received it like that but I mean it was work and it was a lot of quite unglamorous work Um, (laughs) yeah opening up an inbox full of hundreds upon hundreds of dick pics and going through all of them I always looked at every single one but I reviewed a tiny fraction of them Early in the blog's days, I used to just ask for donations, you know, if anybody was enjoying the site and wanted to kind of show their support. And people were quite generous, but I noticed that people have a certain amount of patience for being asked for money or being asked for donations. Right. So when I first did a call for hit up my PayPal, if you like, I got a really good response, and then when I did it again a couple of months later, it was smaller and smaller, and I I realized I had to come up with some kind of, give some value, I suppose, which kind of contradicts what you're saying, because the idea was that I was always providing labor and providing value, but I guess it made it more immediate to people what they were paying for. You weren't guaranteeing a response. And I think that's the key point there is that 
it kind of resists a, this sense of entitlement that just by sending you something that they deserve a response. I mean, I would always, I actually replied to every single person who ever sent me a dick pic throughout the That is very generous. <laughs> 99% of the time to say, thank you for your submission, but you won't be one of the few making it onto the site. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, everybody who did appear on the site, I would let them know when they're review was up I just felt like even though maybe sending a dick pic is not a great labor for many of these senders that at least I should have you know acknowledge and thank them for participating so tell me I'm really curious after looking at all of these pictures what do you think makes a good dick pic so the tip that I was constantly repeating was zoom out Basically, the standard dick pic, which I coined the log or the log shot, is a kind of bird's eye view shot looking down onto the penis and with it taking up basically the entire frame of the photo. And most dick pics are like that. And they're so boring because it's just penis. Like there's no... (laughs) No context or anything. Yeah no kind of narrative at all and right that's what most dick pics look that's the sort of starting point it seems to be for men in particular who take dick pics the two main things I was saying was zoom out a little bit more so that I can see the rest of your body and change the angle around so that it's not you taking the shot down on yourself but use a self timer or even a selfie stick or whatever you need to have the angle coming a different way it kind of decenters the body itself in terms of like aesthetics or sexual attractiveness or something. It kind of says to men that it's not enough just to inhabit a body that has a big dick or whatever, but yeah. it actually matters how you take up space in the world and how you present yourself. And like your sexuality is a much bigger thing than just winning some sort of genetic lottery. Exactly. And I think that men and straight men in particular are not used to thinking of themselves and their bodies like this. Women are. Women are really used to thinking of themselves as, you know, sexual and sexual objects and the kind of being on the receiving end of a gaze. And men on the whole just don't seem to conceive of themselves like that. And that's exactly like you say. That's why they just say, look, here's my dick. I think that's really interesting, like the way that you two are framing it, though, because it also shows that part of being aware of the gays and the way that women like have been socialized to be also means being able to imagine or see yourself from the perspective of somebody else, which seems to be absent in the way that these pictures are taken. There were practical tips that I was often repeating. And, you know, we talked about zooming out and focusing on not just the penis, but the rest of the body. And there were others like making sure that your environment was at least tidy and there wasn't piles of dirty laundry. (laughs) We were just talking about that. I was saying that I don't understand why people put up pictures online when their room is a mess. I know. it was. Yeah, it was endlessly frustrating to me. And I was constantly (laughs) talking about it. She was talking about a model on Twitter and went, wow, she's so hot, but her room is messy. I just can't get over that. (laughs) And I mean, my room is messy, too, but I hide that in my pictures. (laughs) My room's always messy, but you don't want the world seeing that, I would have thought. Right. I would also often say, consider the desires of your recipient. And this was kind of a revelation to to some of these guys because that was an entire component that they hadn't thought of. I mean, what does the person I'm sending this dick pic to actually want to see? I mean, for a lot of people who send dick pics, I don't think they consider that or care at all. There is this sort of aspect to the culture of dick pic sending that is you're intending to maybe shock someone or you literally just want to show someone how big your penis is. It like demonstrates a lack of empathy. <laughs> in a- yeah, it does. But I think for a lot of the people who were sending pictures to me, you know, they were sending these pictures in good faith. 
but they were still quite clueless about what women wanted to see. How long did you run the blog? About five years. Wow. Did you see any sort of shift over that period of time? Did people get better at it? People did get better at it. And there was a slightly encouraging shift in terms of the quality. But the vast majority remained pretty basic. I certainly noticed that there were people who had been following the blog for a long time that were reading and kind of listening to what I was saying. So they would mm-hmm. see pictures and they would say, look, I've done what you've said to do. I've zoomed out and I've cleaned up my messy bedroom. Um, <laughs> it didn't always mean that they took perfect kind of A plus grade pictures, but right. I could see that the message was getting through a little bit which is about all you can hope for. That raises an interesting question, though. Are you going to do anything to archive the blog? Are we going to backslide if we lose all this collective knowledge about how to take better dick pics if Tumblr erases it? Yeah, I mean, Tumblr's policy came as a shock to me, and I just was in a bit of a daze for a couple of days after learning the news wondering what I was going to do and whether I could continue the project somewhere else. You know, people said just turn it into a subreddit or go to all these various sites that, to be honest, I hadn't even heard of. And I decided to do So I did a kind of obituary to the blog, and that's the final post that's on the blog now. It had a good run, and maybe this was a natural sort of point for it to finish. Do you have like a best of reel? I mean, I've been approached by quite a few publications that want to interview me and kind of talk about the project. I mean, the project was in the media quite often. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to say now in the wake of it. And one good thing to do would be to highlight the very best dick pics that I ever received. I mean, I'm just curious about what that might mean. As you said at the beginning of the interview, there's so much negativity around the idea of dick pics, and for good reason. And there's obviously often the sending of dick pics run up against a lot of consent issues. But even if consent is there, as you suggested, there are all these other aesthetic issues and issues with the male gaze that are embedded in the dick pics. And so there does seem to be something like really powerful and interesting about asking the question of what a good dick pic is as the blog has. And like, maybe now you're in a space where you could provide some answers in like a really concrete way. Yeah, I think so. And something that I noticed as, and I talk about this a bit in the Mal piece about the male gaze is that the longer that the project went on, the more I realized the kind of initial reason that I started the blog, which was to do with making the experience of receiving a dick pic more pleasant for women was complicated because I started receiving dick pics from so many different types of people. Dick Mm -hmm. pics taken by cis women, dick pics taken by trans women, dick pics that were intended to be sent to men. You know, it really complicated this idea that dick pics are something that men send and women receive. Dicks are something that men have. Right. So when I think about that question of what were the best dick pics, often they were sent by queer people or trans women in particular sent some of the dick pics that ended up getting A pluses. Yeah. So, yeah, I think like looking back at the project would, would always have to take that into account, that it ended up just being such a different question. Yeah, that's really interesting, and it and raises a lot of really important representational issues, I think. Yeah. Going back to what we were saying about the gays, that some of the better dick pics were sent by people who weren't cis straight men. I suppose there could be lots of reasons for that, but one of them is surely that it's only really straight men who are used to occupying the gaze, at least in terms of seeing their gaze represented in mainstream media. And that's starting to change. And I talk again about that in the piece that 
a female gaze and a queer gaze is becoming a tiny bit more common or you can at least find examples of it now but Mm -hmm. throughout history the gazer has been a straight man and so it's only everybody else who can kind of entertain these questions of well who is this dick pic for and what is the dick pic for am I trying to just show someone the size of my dick or am I trying to turn someone on a little bit or play or do something artful or do anything that isn't just my own pov on my own dick (laughs) (laughs) no that is really interesting it's probably a good opportunity to turn more directly to the piece itself which is titled the state of the male gaze so it's very specifically you're talking us through kind of the history of this concept of the male gaze and what it means to us in the present, but the the concept itself is actually pretty old. <laughs> I was actually just going to say it's pretty new. <laughs> is it? The well, concept no, I of mean the... in the seventies, but I guess it just depends on what your reference think... point is. Yeah, it's just funny that you said that. Well, yeah, that is. But I mean, <laughs> it's more associated with second wave feminism, I guess, yeah. is what I was thinking, as opposed to a more contemporary feminism or queer politics. Definitely. I mean, so what Mel does Mel Magazine, who hosted the piece, every year at the end of the year, they do a big state of type piece and they tackle enormous subjects like the state of male body image and the state of the internet was one of them. And this year they said, we want to do one about the male gaze because there's so much to say about it. Is it a really redundant idea now that we have female filmmakers and all this kind of queer representation or is there still something in it so yeah they they basically just handed me this absolutely enormous topic let me know what you think (laughs) it's very relative whether you think it's an old idea or a new idea but it, it is unequivocally a second wave idea right in the thick of the second wave and it suffered from some classically kind of second wave problems in that, you know, immediately Bell Hooks said, well, which women are you talking about? You don't yeah. talking about black women. It was really eye-opening to me when I read that for the first time. Which piece is this? I forgot what it was called, but it's in a piece on cinema, Black Female Gaze. It's called The Oppositional Gay. Well, I don't know. I can't mm-hmm. remember full title but basically she introduces the idea of an oppositional gaze as opposed to just the male gaze and all sorts of critics started to do that in the wake of Mulvey's piece and some criticism was fairer than others because people said well you're assuming that everyone in the audience is a straight man and she clarified this later and said I never I never really assumed that but I was talking about what tended to happen, and also where the power was, you know. Right. Right. That's actually one of the interesting things that came out of your piece is to talk about where is the money in advertising, who controls what these images are. Yeah, and I think that's the most interesting lens through which you can look at the male gaze now is that, I mean, we almost have a kind of capitalist gaze or at least – yeah. It really just depends where the money is. And so all these examples that we have now of the female gaze and two classic examples that keep coming up are Magic Mike, XXL, and Twilight. And mm-hmm. people people cite these as basically evidence that the male gaze is over and we have a female gaze now and everything's fine and the male gaze is a dead idea. We don't have to worry about it now. And there's talk about the queer gaze now, and there are a few kind of TV shows where you can see this evidence. I talked about Vita. But the longer that I thought about it and as I was writing the piece, it still just felt like we really haven't come particularly far in 44 years. I mean, I still think if you look at most media and take even that very sort of rudimentary framing that Mulvey had in her original essay it still fits yeah 
it makes sense to me that that's still something we're really struggling with. We've been covering a lot of the policies restricting adult content on social media and just the way that adult content is handled on social media in general. And like one of the trends you see, for example, is that we've talked to many models where they'll have situations where a male photographer will post a picture of them. And then they post the exact same picture of themselves. And when the male photographer does it, it doesn't get flagged. It's considered art. It's somehow legitimized because it's presented by a man and through their gaze. And then when the female model presents the very same image saying, hey, this is me expressing myself then that is somehow taken to be more offensive and is much more prone to removal, to being flagged for content violations. Even if those policies aren't explicitly written into the system, in practice, they're still policed in a way that men are allowed to represent women's bodies with much more freedom than women are allowed to frame and represent their own bodies. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think even just that phrase, female presenting nipples, which was... Oh my gosh, I know. (laughs) It's outrageous. It's so outrageous and it's so obviously gendered and... It's not really a new kind of problem. I mean, there's there's been this issue on Instagram for a long time and to the point where some, there are entire Instagram accounts now that are dedicated to just challenging this policy and, right. and what counts as a female presenting nipple. Yeah, I'm glad that you guys are covering it because it's quite alarming. Facebook is where people spend enormous amounts of their time and also where people organize, you know, it's it's where people plan events. No, it's a huge problem. It pushes everyone who's part of any sort of marginalized sex community or has any sort of like marginalized sexual identity off platforms. And even if it doesn't explicitly disinvite those people, what it does is it gives tools to reactionary bigots through which they can silence marginalized people. I mean, you're exactly right. And the way that these systems are set up is that they're based on reporting by other users, exactly as you say. They invite this kind of mob mentality and mass reporting and you do see this happening you see people coordinating to report queer people women anyone on sex workers yeah sex workers so you have all these kind of examples where I mean Twitter is the social media site where I for better or worse spend most of my time usually for worse and (laughs) likewise (laughs) where there will be kind of feminist women who very early on Twitter have said kill all men or men need to die or something like this and they've had their entire account suspended because they were advocating for the genocide of men and (laughs) people organise on 4chan and target particular women and they organise and they report en masse and it works. These accounts get suspended, and meanwhile, Nazis, right. full on Nazis, thrive on Twitter. One of the things that you said that I thought was really interesting that we've also noticed is that from the 90s and the early 2000s, a lot of folks' relationship to feminism was much more fraught than it is now. And now it's almost seen as something that one ought to align themselves with. Can you talk a little bit about what you think is going on there? Yeah. Um, I don't know what's going on there, but it definitely, it's true. And I can remember being a feminist and being happy to claim the label of feminist when I was at university 10 years ago. And even at that point, it being a very dirty word, Mm -hmm. you would never say it in kind of polite company, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And every time you said you're a feminist, you had to immediately qualify that you shaved your legs and you didn't hate men. That was just the stereotype about feminists and I guess kind of a mechanism to stop women wanting to be feminists. 
Right. right. Somewhere along the way, there was a kind of shift. And I think it was a corporate led shift because it's now almost mandatory to call yourself a feminist, but only a certain kind of feminist, I think. So feminism is almost, it's not a meaningless label now, but you can call yourself a feminist and you can mean many different things. So mm-hmm. you can be a kind of lean in Sheryl Sandberg feminist, which I think is the most acceptable way to call yourself a feminist now in a mainstream sense. Right. It's like palatable to corporate interest. Exactly. I mean, all that that means is that you would like to see a few more white middle-class CEO women as well as white middle-class CEO men that are already dominating boardrooms. And in, in that kind of framework, the focus is never on women who clean those boardrooms or sex working women or women of color. It's this very individualistic form of feminism that coheres completely with neoliberal capitalism, you know. Yeah. It's not, right. radical. it's not radical. It's not challenging to the status quo in any way. And that's why I think you can see it almost everywhere. Whereas being a Marxist feminist or a, a sex working feminist or, you know, there, there are all these different kinds of feminism that are still, you're still not, you're not going to be popular if you say that you're a Marxist feminist. I actually think it kind of depends on what context you're in. I mean, both of us teach in gender and sexuality and women's studies departments. And I feel like what happened at the beginning of when I was teaching 15 years ago is that none of my students wanted to identify as feminist. And now they do. But the interesting thing is that a lot of younger people now, it seems like they want to identify as intersectional feminists. But I'm not quite sure what that means to them. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's very context dependent. And I'm looking at it from what's palatable to the mainstream. But of course, there are these pockets where the word woke gets thrown around constantly these days. Yeah, You're young and you're online. You want to be as woke as possible. And the right kind of feminist to be is an intersectional one. And rightly so. Like you say, it's not always clear exactly what that means. Because, I mean, being an intersectional feminist is very different than being a lean-in feminist, but part of that may be generational. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question, though, to think about how feminism is being taken up now and how it does become almost like an obligatory thing in order to have some sort of cachet within communities, but that means a lot of different things. Yeah, it does. I saw something on Twitter a year or two ago that said, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but it was something like make feminism a threat again. And huh. it stuck with me because I think that that's the difference now is that part of the reason that you had to, when I say you, I mean kind of reactionaries, had to just sure. look at feminism and create this idea that it's only ugly, lesbian, hairy-legged women that participate in this worldview was mm-hmm. because it was threatening. Yeah. Feminism was threatening to the current world order and the status quo. And there's definitely been a sort of trend towards feminism being incorporated by the status quo. I liked the idea that maybe whatever kind of way that you label yourself a feminist, perhaps your feminism should actually be a bit scary to the powers that be. Yeah, I like that too. No, I totally hear that. I would say one possible positive side to the mainstreaming of feminism is that I think it may have made things like the Me Too movement easier, whereas when feminism was seen as a dirty word, then even having the kinds of conversations that were identified with feminism was treated as problematic. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's true. Although when you look at the Me Too movement, I mean, at the moment, the women that we are being asked to relate to and empathize with very powerful women in Hollywood, mainly. Right. 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 Rich and like conventionally beautiful women. Which is not to say that those women don't deserve our empathy, but there's been some great commentary about, well, do you have any idea how much cleaners get? 
sexually, you know, women who clean right. towels and how often they get sexually harassed in their workplaces. And again, sex working women, it's, I think it's true. Women are more likely now to identify as feminists and it means that movements like Me Too have a lot more traction than they ever would have. Yeah. But it, it still bears the question of, you, you know, which women are we leaving out and which women are we talking about when we say that we're feminists? No, right. that's a really, really, really good point. And a more radical feminism would be a more inclusive feminism. Yeah. Uh, one last thing before we go. I also read, and I thought this was really interesting, your most recent article about men having an easier time seeing life coaches than therapist. And part of the reason that I thought that was interesting is I write and I actually also recently wrote something about how men are also more likely to see sex workers for their therapeutic needs than they are to actually go to therapists. And so I think there's something I think that story that you did is really interesting. Oh, your story sounds really interesting, too. And it occurred to me while I was writing this piece, and I spoke to my editor about it a little bit. And we decided to just focus narrowly on the life coach question. But basically, Mm -hmm. there are all sorts of things that men will do rather than go to therapy. And it definitely occurred to me that seeing sex workers was one, but also just treating the women in their lives as de facto therapists. Yeah, absolutely. Demanding free emotional labor from the women that surround them at work or at home or wherever else. Yeah, exactly. And I think I'd, I would like to read your piece, and I haven't yet, and I don't know what you say about this, but, you know, this dynamic of men seeing life coaches more readily than they'll see therapists. And part of it is this traditional conception of masculinity and it being a very sort of feminized activity to sit down and talk about your feelings and particularly talk about some of your most painful feelings and maybe mm-hmm. cry and up. Right. And that was a big reason that, I concluded that men preferred to do life coaching because it has a much more kind of cheerleader aspect to it. There's ways in which men are kind of allowed to feel their feelings. And those are really circumscribed to be allowed to focus on success like you do with a life coach. Like that's okay because men are supposed to be ambitious and they're supposed to be successful, but they're not supposed to be vulnerable. And so I think that was interesting with the sex workers. What I was interested in is the fact that so in the same way that it's okay for men to be ambitious or to be driven or success oriented, it's also okay for men to seek out sex, but it's not okay for men to seek out emotional intimacy. So they kind of couch their desires for emotional intimacy or uh, wrap them up in desires for sex. And I think that's why like it's less stigmatized for men to see sex workers than it is for men to go to therapists. Yes, definitely. I was going to say another thing that I found was it often came down to access as well. So Mm -hmm. there was this component of, well, this is a kind of girly thing to do so men don't want to do therapy. But then there was also the reality that when men want to see a therapist, it's often far too expensive for them. And there are some studies that show that black men and working class men, even if they're insured, will be turned down by therapists. Mm. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, so there is a side to it that men are reluctant to do therapy And then there's also another aspect, which is even when men want to do therapy, sometimes it's unaffordable and inaccessible for them. Whereas life coaching, I found some life coaches online who charge $16 a session. What do you think is going on with the therapists there? Do you think that therapists, too, are contributing to the problem in the sense they don't necessarily know how to interact with men like do you think this is a systemic issue particularly like men of color or working class men yeah I think that it is I mean that study clearly showed that there's discrimination going on on the part of therapists Mm -hmm. but part of that I think is probably that there is this this problem with being able to relate to certain clients right and so I read a lot about psychologists who are starting to alter their practice to better accommodate men. Mm -hmm. So they will go for a walk with their clients rather than sit and talk face to face, or they'll throw a ball around or they'll go out and get a meal. 
Um, oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, there was a lot of talk about even avoiding the label therapy and so talking about consultations rather than sessions and mm-hmm. lots of ways to make therapy less intimidating to masculine men. I'm I've not actually sure that- never had that thought about just the space of therapy and the sort of face-to-face sedentary way in which it's set up. That's really interesting. Yeah, neither had I. And it hadn't really occurred to me that that was particularly kind of feminine, I guess. But I suppose yeah. when, you know, throwing a ball around being kind of the classic, you know, manly man way of unwinding or being kind of comfortable enough to kind of then talk about your feelings. Yeah. I mean, as a parent of teenagers, that makes a lot of sense to me because if I sit at the dinner table and ask my teenagers like what they did that day, they often won't say anything. But if you sit in the car with them for half an hour and you're both staring at the road, they'll say lots of things. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. I linked to a- another piece that went live on Mel, which I also found quite an interesting kind of counter argument to that idea, which was, and it occurred to me as I was looking into these attempts to make therapy more manly that I don't know I wondered how much you can kind of use traditional masculinity to counter traditional masculinity if you know what I mean Mm -hmm. it was almost yeah where kind of taking as read that you know men don't want to be vulnerable I don't know I mean I think it's bound to be useful to get men in the door which is right right but can you use the master's tools to tear down the master's house kind of thing Yes, exactly. One point, one really good point that the article I linked to raised was, well, if you're talking about queer men, for example, who might need therapy or might be struggling because they feel like they don't fit the traditional model of masculinity, to then say, you know, oh, well, we're therapists for men, so we throw balls around yeah. in here and we have wood panelled, you know, offices and... <laughs> Yeah, they look like man caves or whatever. No, totally. Yeah. I was yeah. thinking that while we were all talking. I was like, I could see why that would work, but I would hate that kind of therapy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that I would was- definitely prefer the traditional model personally, but I also understand why that might be valuable to some men who more readily identify with their own masculinity. Yeah. So it's complicated, and I think you probably need lots of different approaches. Which is more broadly true of therapy in general and not just in terms of gender divisions. Yeah, exactly. But this conversation is really interesting. I mean, just as a side note, you know, it's like the 20th anniversary of The Sopranos, right? And this was yeah. like... W- is you it know, really? W- yeah. That's wild. And it, this was one of the central themes, I think, in that show was men's resistance to both therapy and medical interventions, that it was perceived as emasculating to not be able to have total control and mastery over one's own body and one's own emotions, and that to not be like wholly self-sufficient in that, but to have to talk to somebody else or to have to take medicine in order to be able to be emotionally and physically stable was something that Tony really struggled with, right, in the show, and actually had to be reframed as a masculine thing for him to do that and to take charge of his life. Yeah, and he's constantly trying to hit on his therapist, which I guess right that point about well, it's okay if I'm trying to have sex with you, but it's not okay if I'm just sitting here talking about my feelings. Right. Right. And it's a very fraught relationship. There is, it's a cross-class relationship. They relate because they're Italian, but like really they're from completely different worlds. Yeah. So it's actually interesting just because so much of that conversation, I think is, that we just had is is packed into that show and a sort of a recurrent theme throughout that show. But it also occurred to me when you were talking that the way the men interact in that show is they play cards, right? They're like triangulating their interactions through poker or they're triangulating their interactions through the strip club, but not directly interacting with each other, always interacting with each other through something else. Yeah, exactly. Like a ball, like throwing a ball. Right, like throwing a ball, exactly, Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Or driving in a car facing forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As someone who likes to just talk face to face, it has never really occurred to me. Yeah. I mean, my preferred, yeah, that's why I thought it was so interesting what you said, because I would always prefer just to talk to somebody. <laughs> yeah. And to not have to do some other activity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, my friends who are like, hey, let's go, you know, bowl or do something. I'm like, why would we do that? Why can't we just sit and talk? We just sit a cup of tea and talk. I know. <laughs> do I have to do the other activity in order to see you? I don't <laughs> Yeah. Where can people find your stuff? I mean, I'm on Twitter and my at is winning protocol. Okay. My work for Mel Magazine, I write under the name Madeline Holden. So... Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's been great to talk. It has. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of the Peep Show podcast. I'm PJ Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at PJ Sage. And I'm Jesse Sage, and you can find me on Twitter at sapiotextual or at jessiesage.com. We would like to remind you that we have a Patreon account and would appreciate your support. Please visit patreon.com slash peepshowpodcast. Our music is courtesy of Joe Kennedy. The show was produced by Jesse and PJ Sage. Signing off. Have a great week.